1 Samuel chapter number 10. I feel God today. Verses 6 through 10. Listen now to the word of the Lord. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. This is the prophet Sam Samuel talking to Saul before he is anointed king. In fact, he's already been anointed king. And Samuel is prophesying to him what will happen next. Somebody say next. I saw the, your grandson praising the Lord today like he was out of, there's an anointing on that little, it, li, listen, jumping up and down like he's crazy. Love it. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon you, Saul, and you shall prophesy with them, the other prophets, and shall be turned into another man talking about a divine encounter only God can turn you into another man verse 7 and let it be when he turns you into the other man let it be when these signs are come unto thee that thou do as occasion serve thee for God is with thee look at your neighbor and say God's with you now listen to the instructions, and thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt sacrifices. Samuel is saying to Saul, I'm going to meet you at an appointed time, and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry. Wait for me for seven days till I come to thee, and I'm going to show you what to do. This is the prophetic instruction now. Wait for me till I reach. Don't do nothing till I come. And I'm going to show you what to do next. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God, this is the encounter, gave him another heart. Sounds like a transplant to me. And all those things came to pass. When did they come to pass? Come on, read it. When did they come to pass? Look at somebody and tell them it's going to happen today. Mm. Oh, Jesus. Abba. Last verse in verse 10. And when they came hither, thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. Saul, that is. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And Saul prophesied among them so far the scripture text father in the name of jesus we need your anointing can't do nothing till you come i've prepared i've studied i've set before you i've pulled away now god that's not enough we need the holy ghost holy ghost you're already here so do what you want to do somebody watching today is waiting for this word May this be the transforming word that shifts them today. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone say amen. Before you take your seat, I want to speak to you today from the subject, how to cancel your encounter with God. I know that don't make much sense right now. But I want to talk about how to nullify, how to make it not mean much, your encounter with God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Allow me for just a few moments to set this text up by stating that there are some misconceptions that we have about the Bible. All this month I've been preaching from the subject, the Holy Ghost inspired the theme, Encountering God. We started on first Sunday, uh, Pastor Lynn, with the prophetic encounter with Elijah, encountered God in the cave at Mount Horeb in the still small voice. Then it was on to Adam, the first man, and in the Garden of Eden, how he encountered God in the cool of the day. We took that third Sunday off, and Pastor Clement came and talked about how God would be encountered in the storm. Came back on last week and talked about the Apostle John and how he encountered God all alone on the Isle of Patmos. And today we shall see how Saul's encounter with God changed his life. Allow me to suggest that much of our understanding of the Bible must grow over time with more study. 
This man that you see on the screen, he's looking and he's surprised that when he reads the Bible, some stuff that he thought was there is not there. Some stuff that he thought was there isn't there. You got to know it for yourself. Some of these man-made doctrines and rules that require us to require us to go back in the Word of God and see what the Bible has to say. Our tendency is to take man's word over God's word. And so now we've lived under generations of people who refuse to use God's word as their final authority. We would rather hold to our own laws. We'd rather hold to Robert's rule of order and the things that we've come up with that make us comfortable. But I'm from the old school. If you want me to believe something, you've got to show it to me. Somebody say in the book. The reason why we run from the Jehovah's Witness is because we don't know the book. The reason why we stay away from any kind of argument that demonstrates a fundamental understanding of the word of God is because we simply don't know the book. What is most disturbing to me, church, is week after week, as the people of God, we ask people from the world to abandon whatever they believe and to embrace and follow the teachings of God's word. That's what we do every week. We ask people, suspend what you believe and trust this book. Yet, we as a church, we are refused, we refuse to be held to the same standard. If a preacher can show you something Sunday after Sunday and it is written in God's word, you are serious, somebody, when you will hold on to your personal position over God's word. God's word demands from the preacher, from the pulpit to the pew to the door, that whatever God's word says, we change and we adapt to God's word. I know I wasn't going to get too many amens. We've now adapted the word of God to us. Now, while I would never disparage, uh, disparage the teaching of our forebears and spiritual leaders in the church, I have also come to understand that we have not, we have not studied as deeply as we should. And there are some characters in the Bible that we have misjudged uh, uh, and mischaracterized and prejudged some persons in the Bible because we don't understand and we don't have a complete revelation of what God is doing in their lives. For example, we all taught that Eve was the evil woman who messed Adam up. But now we understand that Eve was the one that was made and left vulnerable by Adam's inability to protect her as he was instructed by God. The women should have given me a hand right there. We were taught, and some of us believed, that Hagar was the whore. That she was the side piece of Abraham who lured him out of the will of God. But now we know that it was not Hagar's idea, it was Sarah's idea to use Hagar as a surrogate mother. And that Hagar was just a slave who really had no say in the matter. We also came to know that Hagar had a relationship with God because when she was out there and the sun was scorching hot, she prayed that God would save her child's life and God did. I wish somebody would give God some kind of praise for Hagar. May I suggest we take another look at Saul? Because maybe we've judged him prematurely. Saul is, is an example of a man who is commonly misunderstood. And let's look at the history and the story a little closer in these next 24 minutes that I have. And let's learn about this encounter with God. Give me just a moment to set this story up. And I promise you, by the time as I come to the end, Professor Terry, if the Spirit helps me, you will gain a firmer understanding of how encounters with God can work and how we can blow them if we're not careful. Let's begin by stating some facts about the circumstances around Saul becoming the first king of Israel. According to Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 8, uh, it was the elders of the town that gathered themselves in a meeting with prophet Samuel and told him that they wanted a king over Israel like everybody else. Saul was nowhere to be found when this conversation happened. Having a king was not Saul's idea. Point number two, Saul never asked to be king. We don't see that written anywhere in the Bible. He did not choose himself, nor did he anoint himself to be king. 
according to 1 Samuel chapter number 9, Saul was chosen by God. Somebody say chosen by God. My God, it's a dangerous thing to be chosen by God. In our text, the prophet Samuel anoints Saul to be the first king of Israel. And when the day came for Samuel to present Saul to the people, he says, now I've anointed the next king. And I've come to present the next king to you. Ladies and gentlemen, meet your next king. And when he did his hand like this, nobody was there. He said, but man, I told Saul to meet me here at 9 o'clock. I was going to tell the people he's the king. Nowhere they looked and they looked and they could not find him. And according to the text, the spirit of the Lord had to reveal to the prophet where Saul was. Saul was somewhere hiding in the baggage. Put the next picture up. Saul was somewhere hiding behind somebody's suitcase. He did not want the assignment. Sometimes you hate people because God chose them. But what you don't know is if they had to make the choice themselves, they would have never chosen themselves. They had plans to do other things. But I want to preach to somebody that God put his hand on you. It wasn't you that chose God, but God chose. Isn't that what the Bible says? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. If you are chosen today, this is a good place in the service to clap your hands and give your God a praise for choosing you. I want you to put your hand on your chest and say, me, me, me. He chose me. See, y'all ain't saying that because you're too scared. Put your hand on your chest and say, he chose me. Now let me turn this dangerous curve and have my seat. There's no question that according to the text, the prophetic anointing came over Samuel as he was anointing Saul. And he told him prophetically, listen, thou shalt be turned into another man. Somebody say another man. So for those of you that believe people can't change, this is a scripture to get you right. God turned him in an instant into a completely different man. You're going to be another man, Saul. Samuel was preparing Saul for the miraculous change that was going to come about in his life with one turn. Uh, the, prophet, the prophet went on to say, God is going to show you a few signs. And when you see these signs, you're going to know that God is with me, with you. My question to you, has God shown you enough signs for you to know that God is with you? I promise you the sign that you woke up this morning ought to tell you that God is with you. Now, I want to put these scripture verses up on the screen, and I want to show you from the word of God. Then you make up your mind depending on what you see. 1 Samuel chapter number uh, uh, 10 verse 9. The Bible says, and so it was that when he turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. I want you to see him. You're going to be Samuel. I'm going to be Saul. He's just anointed me. Pour your hand like you anointed me. Good. The Bible says when he turned his back to go home, the change was instant. Don't tell me God needs seven years to change you. Don't tell me God got to show you me for five months and eight hours to change me or to prove to you has changed me. God can turn a man around and change him. I wish you would snap your finger and go just like that. See, y'all don't believe the word of God. According to this text, as soon as he turned around with the word of God, God Gave him a new heart. And part of why we carry around the same heart is because we refuse to turn. But the moment you make up your mind, you're going to turn from some stuff. God has the power to take those stuff away from you. I wish I had five witnesses up in here. I ain't supposed to be preaching yet because it's too early in the sermon. But I got to make the devil mad because he wants to tell five or six of you that you'll never change, that you'll never break the habit, that you'll never find yourself to be free, that you'll be dealing with it for the rest of your life. But are there ten of you that could say when I turn from Jesus, when I turn towards Jesus, Jesus. And when I turned away from Satan, I made up my mind. One turn would be enough. And I never look back. Clap your hands if you believe that you can turn. I wonder if I got 50 of y'all that'll stand to your feet and just turn one good time. Do it prophetically. Do it in the will of the Holy Ghost. The Bible said when he turned from Samuel, the change was instant. 
How about so? It's going to be in your obedience today. Y'all sit down. Let me read page three of this essay. Now, something must have happened, sisters and brothers, along the way. Something must have happened that changed things from what God had spoken and from what Saul really wanted to do to change it to how Saul's life ended up. Something must have gone wrong because when he turned around, God was with him. When he turned around, he had a new heart. Something went wrong. God had a plan for his life and something went wrong. May I suggest to you that your encounter with God can be major and profound. You can sit in here and feel God and feel the presence of the Lord shaking like two worlds coming together. But unless you protect what God has put on you, unless you protect your mind and protect your heart, uh, the Bible says the word fell on stony ground and and the birds came and picked it and ate it away. And what you don't understand, there's a mean, angry bird always hanging around you. And so when God puts the word in you, that's why the Bible says, thy word have I did what? Have I hid it in my heart so that I may not sin against God? There's a bird waiting to pick this word right out of you. They come to church every Sunday, mouth long and sticky. And as soon as the word hits you, they hold it, let me wait till you get out outside in the parking lot. And here come the bird to steal it. But I dare you to put it deep in your spirit. I dare you to put it down in your sanctified soul so nobody can get to it. Ah, oh, you can mess up your encounter with God. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 10. And they're gonna put verse 10. Just go right up one verse. And listen to this now. And when they came thither to the hill, I'm gonna show you now how you can mess up what God has already put into your life. The Bible says when Samuel, when Saul, he's a new anointed king. It's not official yet, but he just has the private anointing. When he came to the thither to the hill, but the Bible says, behold, a company of prophets met him and the son of God came upon him. So don't tell me Saul wasn't God's choice. Don't tell me Saul wasn't God's choice. Don't tell me Saul wasn't God's choice. Because the Bible Bible said the spirit of God is capital S spirit so it wasn't his emotions it was the actual Holy Ghost came upon him and the Bible says he prophesied amongst them he was with the prophets prophesying amongst them and when you go back and look at it, the text in the Greek and in the Hebrew it is saying he was among the prophets prophesying to the prophets he had elevated was elevated in God and God used him in the prophetic now go one more verse, and I'm going to change this directory of this sermon. Put up verse number 11. Come on, flow with me right in here. Verse number 11 says, but the children, glory to God, hallelujah. No, no, go back to verse 11. There, there it is. And it came to pass that all knew him before time, saw that. Behold, he prophesied amongst the prophets. Look at this now. Verse 11 says, and it came to pass when they saw Saul prophesying, the people that knew him, somebody say before time. You only saying it loud, say before time. I want you to see how you can mess up your core. I want you to see how you can start doubting what God has spoken to your life. The text says, Saul prophesied and the people that knew him when he was a boy, the people that knew him when he was messing up, the people that knew him before he really was anointed, they said, behold, how could he prophesy amongst the prophets? They recognized that he did it and they didn't understand. Then the people said one to another, I want you you to see that huh? the Bible said then the people they can put it up it's on there huh? what is this the people said one to another huh? hallelujah to Jesus huh? what is this that is come unto the son of Kish huh? they want to know how could Saul isn't he just a regular somebody huh? we know his daddy Kish huh? we know he ain't come from nothing huh? we knew him beforehand huh? point number one huh? the thing that can mess up your encounter with God huh? is familiar people huh? listen to me people that know you people that know you before God changed you 
they discouraged Saul and questioned how God could possibly use him even after he prophesied to the prophets this bothered him so much this disturbed Saul so much till on the day of his coronation the biggest day of his life when he was supposed to stand before the people Saul when he heard the people saying how could he prophesy when he saw the doubt in the minds of his kindred folks he allowed that familiar spirit to get up into his head and when it was his time to be elevated he hid amongst the bags he was nowhere to be found sisters and brothers there's a concept called a familiar spirit and what a familiar spirit does is it uses familiar come familiar spirits come from people who are familiar with you familiar spirits is from the derivative of the word family these are the people that know you well these are the people that were there when you started out the Bible said these familiar spirits was what got up in Saul's head it was people that knew him that people that thought he was not worthy that people that think he shouldn't have thought that he shouldn't have been king that people that said Saul you need to know your place you ain't qualified to prophesy and they got so much up in Saul's head that when the main day came for him to be presented when the purpose of God was supposed to be unfolding in his life instead of coming forward Saul was backing up and hiding and the truth of the matter is there's some of you in here you should be a little further ahead there's some of you in here the call of God is on your life there's some of you in here the day of coronation has arrived your ministry should be in full bloom you should be healing people by now you should be prophesying by now but because people giving you the side eye and there's so much familiar spirits in the church that don't want to see you succeed some of you should have been here a long time it ain't the pandemic that's keeping you home but the familiar spirits and the spirit of guilt and shame got you hiding and backing up and then some of you would even make it as far as the church but you let that familiar spirit come in and all of a sudden your hands are tied up and you can't praise God you can't move into the realms of the spirit because the familiar spirit got you tied down Saul's day had come his opportunity had come but the people that he knew held him down sisters and brothers if you mind the people that you know if you mind the folk in your family if you mind folk in your church family you'll never be nothing in God you'll never rise to prominence your day will never come they said how could Saul prophesy to the prophets he ain't been saved that long how could Saul prophesy to the prophets he ain't graduated from the right seminary how could Saul prophesy to the prophets we know the girlfriend he used to sleep with how could Saul prophesy but if any man if any man be in Christ y'all don't want to hear no preaching y'all too cold to shout but I slept in the Holy Ghost last night if any man be in Christ I've come to preach that he is a new creature and an instant old things can pass away what are you saying Pastor Trent never mind those familiar spirits you give God the praise never mind those family members that'll tell you you ain't qualified to preach that'll tell you you ain't qualified to lead that'll tell you it ain't your season never mind them you come forward anyhow and there's about five of y'all that I'm talking to the Holy Ghost said take three steps forward don't you hide in the luggage I said if I'm talking to you take three steps by faith take three steps forward Lord Jesus the thing that's gonna nullify your call is if you hooked up to familiar spirits I dare to cut them loose David said if my father and my father and my mother forsake me then the Lord he gonna take me up your six it Ah, Jesus. Watch out for familiar spirits. Even Jesus couldn't heal people in Nazareth. Because they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Too familiar. You know what I love about Reverend C.W. Sanders? <laughs> Say what you want about him. He don't let people get too close to him. He was a serious man of God. Any of y'all know Reverend Charles Sanders? You couldn't just walk up to him with no, 
Mambi, you, you straighten up yourself. I, I'm, I'm, I read all the posts from the people who went to Princeville. They knew when they saw that bald head man. Don't come like me and you. What is wrong with the church is there are too many familiar. I'm really going to make somebody mad now. See, see, when you got a leader like Bishop Ross Davis who is humble and who allows you to have access to him, you think after a while you and him is company. That's why you talk the way you do. That's why you act the way you do. Because you think you and him is company. Reverend Sanders kept himself at a place where people will respect him. And there's some people now giving tribute to him that didn't like him when he was alive. But now that he is dead, they're ready to give tribute to him. But God sees and he knows the difference. He knows the people that were supporting him when he was alive. He knows the people that called him shaky and pulled him down and made fun of him. God has the record. Watch out, somebody say, for familiar spirits. 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verse 26 calls us now. The Bible says that Saul is called forward by the prophet in front of the people. He's anointed to be king. Now watch what happens next. 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verse 26. 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verse 26. It reads thus. And Saul went home. This is after he's been anointed. Verse 26 of 1 Samuel chapter 10 says, And Saul went home to Gibeah. And there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had what? Talking about encounters now. So once God prepares you, he will send the people that you need to be with you. So Saul didn't go home by himself. Some people God assigned to Saul that wasn't assigned to him before that now are attached to him. They went home to live in Gibeah with him. Verse, next verse. Now watch this. I want you to read this and see this for yourself. This is in the Bible now. But the children of Belial, say Belial. I can mess you all up today. But the children of Belial said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought what? No presents. But he held his peace. The second group of people that can mess up your encounter are the children of Belial. Let me break that down for you. They're sent to mess up your encounter with God. Saul had already been chosen by God. Saul was anointed by their most trusted prophet. Listen to this. Saul didn't anoint himself, man. Samuel, the prophet who had led them for the last 45 years, the most trusted man of God of the day. He was the one who said, Saul is the king. And yet, the children of Belial, the Bible says, it's in your text. They despised him. And they bought him no presents. As how can he save us? There's always going to be a group that don't believe in you. I want to show you what in the text. The word Belial also means children of Satan. Just in case you didn't know. This is in the text. Look at in the text. The pastor Trent ain't making this up. I don't want nobody to go home and get upset. The Bible says, but the children of Belial... These are Satan's kids folk speaking up. Watch the people who are always criticizing. You got to be careful in this hour who you criticize and what you say, especially if it has anything to do with God. Before you criticize, before you waste time, you are associating yourself with the spirit and the children of Belial and you don't even know it. The text says, they said they despised him, but he held his peace. I want to tell someone that they hold your peace. Lord, if it's one thing Ross Davis showed me how to do, say, try and shut your mouth. Hold your peace. Let everybody talk. You shh, shh, shh. Uh, uh, uh. Not in this season. Hold your peace. I got some good advisors. They said to me, no, no, no. I said, I said what should I do about this? He said, don't say nothing. What should I do about this? Don't say nothing. You, you can talk in a different kind of way. Talk to God. Hold your peace. That's what God told Moses in Exodus chapter 14, verse 14. He said, the Moses, the Lord will fight for you, but just hold your peace. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, the text says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander put slander or put slander listen 
listen to the text. Put slander away from you, along with malice. Be kind one to another and tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. What is wrong with the church? And why can't we be tender hearted? Why can't we be forgiving? Why can't we be long suffering? But we allow this spirit of slander to run up and down in the aisles of our church. James 4.11 says, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law itself and it asks the question who are you to judge your neighbor hold your peace James Cleveland put it this way if I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle then I know that the victory shall be mine it's the children of Belial that you gotta watch out for one other definition of Belial is people who are wicked and people who are worthless I'm not speaking to nobody indirectly because the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So don't misunderstand, Pastor Trent. I ain't thinking about a name of nobody. I'm preaching about spirits that operate in people. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But those children of Belial, they come to church every Sunday and they're looking for somebody to use. They're looking for someone to sit in. They're looking for someone whose eyes they can use uh, to despise Saul. Uh, they're looking to sit in someone uh, who could spend their whole time uh, saying Saul is not God's choice. Uh, and the Bible says uh, the spirit of Belial uh, and the children of Belial uh, said who is he uh, and we will not support him. Uh, they said we will not support him. Uh, they're going to make him king uh, and we got some gifts that we have uh, but we're going to hold back our gifts. Uh, we got some money we could bring uh, but we're going to hold back our money. We got some tithes we can pay. Y'all gonna make me preach this so you could understand it. But we gonna hold back our tithes. Let's hold back our tithes, everybody. The Bible said the children of Belial, they kept their presence to themselves. Now I write this. Watch out for people who tell you stop giving to God. The God that saved you the God that allowed you to have your life and have your being. You've been tithing for 40 years and you can come to the last two years and stop. I was moved to tears this week. One of the oldest members of our church, 80 year old woman. She could hardly walk. She came to the church office and had one of her family members and it took her about 20 minutes to get inside. Shuffling one foot in front of the other. Shuffling one foot in front of the other. She didn't send it inside with him. She brought it inside herself. And when she came and handed me, she said, Pastor Trent, I wasn't able to make it out to Sunday service. But I came with my tithes to pay my tithes unto the Lord. This woman is 80 years old on a fixed income uh, but the God that she served uh, will not allow her to keep the money in her pocket uh, that belongs to God uh, because she is not of the children uh, of Belial sisters and brothers uh, this is what the text said uh, I stood there over her uh, and I spoke a blessing over her uh, I spoke long life over her uh, and she will never be in want uh, her children will never be in want uh, the reason why you still alive right now uh, the reason why you got a little bit of sense and education is because your mother or your grandmother or your grandfather took the little bit of money that they had. I wish I had five of y'all that ain't too proud to tell the truth. You are rich today because your forebears and your ancestors brought their offering and placed it on the altar. How dare you hold God's money back because you don't like Saul. The devil and his my I will give unto God. David said, how can I give unto the Lord something that costs me nothing? Where are the people? It's a joy to give unto the Lord. The Bible says give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. Don't you let that son of Belial tell you not to bring your offerings into the church when the Bible says bring an offering and come into the house of the Lord listen here it's time to present to Saul what God has called
how Jupiter present. Look at this young man doing it right in the act of it right now. God bless you, son. God bless you, son. I just feel it's a good time to sow a seed. It ain't in my sermon, but I want you to prove to the devil I'm not a son of a lie. Get some kind of money and put it on here. Now somebody can get upset and say, Lord, they're putting money on the communion table. Let that upset you for the next two weeks and you'll miss what God is trying to do. This is a time to sow a seed. It's a sacrificial seed. It ain't your offering. It's just what I feel like giving to the Lord. Because if the devil think in his mind, he gonna stop me from paying my tithe. If the devil think for one minute, he gonna stop me from giving God what belongs to him. I'll give offering before offering. I'll give offering through the week. I'll give offering I didn't plan to give. I'll come back on Sunday evening and give some more offering. Because what I will do is I will give unto God how he has prospered me. Listen, listen, listen. Something is happening in this house. We are breaking the curse of the enemy. We are breaking the curse of the enemy. The Bible says when you don't tie to God, you are cursed with a curse. That's a double curse to me. So I don't care which son of a lie. Tell me not to bring this money up in here. I got to bring my gifts. And if Pastor David spend the money, if Pastor Trent spend the money, Pastor Trent will go to hell, but I'll be blessed because I gave to God. Somebody clap your hands and say, oh yes. Lord have mercy. Let me finish this up. I got two seconds to finish this up. Second people to stay away from. Stay away from them children of Belial. Stay king. Now watch God work. We're almost there. Put up 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 15. Now listen to this. Saul becomes king in verse number 10. In chapter number 10. Follow me with this now. We're now in chapter number 11. And in chapter number 11, Saul, as soon as he becomes king, goes to work. There's an Amorite guy by the name of Nashon. This guy, you'll find him in chapter 11. Go back and Nahash. Sorry, Nahash. He's an Amorite. And listen to what he is known for. He is known for putting people's right eye out. That's his, that's his trademark. So Nashon, uh, Nahash, sorry, he goes to, he's an Amorite. He goes to some uh, villages in Israel, and he puts the eye out of the whole village. He goes there and gouges out the right eye of every man. See, you ain't noticed, but Saul. After he puts their eyes out, he sends a message. Let these other villagers know I come in back. And who don't support me, who don't fall under this rain, I can kill you. And as a sign of your surrender, you're going to have to bow and I can gouge your right eye out willingly. You're going to have to come to me in order to live. You're going to have to sacrifice your right eye. I want you to know, sisters and brothers, what the devil is after is your right eye. He's after the thing that you need to see God. This right eye has not only implications in the natural, but it has implications in the spiritual. If he can gouge out your eye, you cannot see clearly what the word of God wants to say. This is the first test, Sister Jenny, that comes to King Saul. And listen to what he does. They spread the rumor that he's coming to get them in a couple days. And this man, this Amorite, he has the power. He has plenty of people with him. And at this time, Saul has just become king, Pastor Paul. He has no army. Listen to what Saul does. It's all in there in 1 Samuel chapter 11. Go back and look at it. The Bible says he, 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 he goes to his field and cuts up a few oxen. Chop them up, butcher them up, and have the, the bloody flesh in their hand. He calls his messengers, uh, and he says to the messengers, uh, I want each of you to take some of this flesh in your hand and go throughout the whole country. Uh, and every man that you see, uh, show him this flesh. Uh, tell him if he don't show up to be in this army tomorrow, uh, when I come back from this battle, uh, I'm going to chop him up like I chop up them oxen. Uh, and the Bible says that the fear of God came upon uh, every man in Israel. Uh, 
And that particular day, uh, the Bible says, uh, 330,000 men uh, came out of hiding uh, and formed an army, uh, all because Saul uh, did what God had told him to do. Uh, the Bible says when Saul saw uh, that there were 300,000 men with him, uh, he went up there. Uh, the Bible says he didn't do it in midnight. Uh, he didn't do it early in the morning. Uh, but Saul waited until the sun came up uh, in the brightness of the day. Uh, the Bible says in the heat of the day. Uh, in other words, Saul was making a statement. Uh, not only am I not the king of Israel, uh, but I got the anointing to fight any enemy uh, that wants to come. Uh, and the Bible says that Saul and the armies of God, uh, they rooted out the Amorites and had them fleeing uh, ten different ways. Uh, Saul had the power of God on his life. Uh, now I want you to put up the result of that uh, in 1 Samuel chapter number 11, uh, verse 15. Uh, I'm almost there and I promise I'm going to get you out of the way. Uh, the Bible says, and all the people went to Gilgal, uh, and there they made Saul king uh, before the Lord in Gilgal, uh, and they sacrificed, keep on going, uh, hallelujah, the sacrifices of peace offerings, uh, and, the, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced. I'm going to show you something. Stay with me. Everybody rejoicing. Now that Saul has won the victory, everybody on Saul's side. <laughs> Watch this. Everybody's with Saul. That's 1 Samuel chapter 11. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 15. See, in order to get these revelations, you can't read three or four verses. You got to go deep into the word of God. God has to reveal himself to you. 1 Samuel chapter 11 now. 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 15. Listen to now. Now, this is how we got to the main point of where Saul made his mistake. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 15 says, when they got, they're now fighting against the Philistines. Because everybody want a piece of them. They're fighting against the Philistines and, 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 and Saul is there and he is waiting for Samuel to come. He is waiting for Samuel to come. And the Bible says, and Saul, this is he tarried, he waited seven days. I told you that was in the beginning. And, they, uh, 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 and that, uh, he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. Samuel told him to wait. But Samuel came not to Gilgal. And I want you to see this. Samuel was late. This is 1 Samuel 13, 15. No, 1 Samuel 13, 8. The Bible says, and the people were scattered from him. Ah. Uh, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. So Saul was in place. But Samuel came not to Gilgal. He was late. Now watch what happened. And there Saul, the Bible says, and the people that were with him were scattered. So in chapter 11, you're the greatest king in the world. Chapter number 13, everybody running from him. Chapter number 11, we with you. Chapter number 13, we gone. This is the third group I want to tell you. Watch out for confused people. Watch out for mixed up people. Watch out for shifty people. Watch out for switches. They was flip flop. They was with him here. Two chapters later, they running from him, Dr. Barry. So there's three groups. One, familiar spirits. Number two, wicked people. Sons of Belial. Three, mix-up people. You got to get away from mix-up people. Because what they did, the Bible says, when Saul saw the people leaving him, he realized he wouldn't have enough people to fight. And so what he did was he was waiting. The seven days had come, and Saul was late, and Samuel was late. So what did Saul do? Saul sacrificed, not because he just felt like sacrificing. He sacrificed because he wanted to know from God if they were going to win. He did the wrong thing because his heart was too connected to the people. I want to pray for someone today. Here's the moment. God has jammed you up in here to be delivered from people. Who are the kinds of people he want to deliver you from? Familiar people, wicked people, and confused used people. Everyone standing, I'm through. Listen to what happens next. He waited. He didn't wait for Samuel. That was the instruction. 
Nobody moving, please. So because he didn't wait for Samuel, and Samuel got there. Samuel said, why you didn't wait for me? I was coming. He said, I got scared because the people left me. He was so tempted to depend on the people and not God. It's not that you have to be mean to people. That's not what I'm saying. Be nice to everyone you can. Love them all. But understand that your call is connected first. There's always going to be people trying to tell you it ain't so. God ain't spoke to you. People who when you tell them this is what God is saying. They do the complete opposite. Leave them alone. Focus on what God told you. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but it is our prayer that even in the height and the hype of the Word of God, that you have had some kind of encounter and experience with God. God wants to meet us every day of our lives. If we are open to Him, He will come, as the Bible says, and sup with us. Well, uh, just before we leave you, there are a few announcements that claim our attention. Uh, watch those, and I'll be back on the other side with a wrap-up. Good morning, Golden Gates. I'm Dakia Scott, and on behalf of the leadership team here at the Gates, we would like to thank you for being in service today. It is our hope and prayer that the worship experience was uplifting and inspiring. Now, here are your news and announcements for the week ahead. There will be a mandatory meeting for all ministers and deacons with Archbishop Ross Davis and Pastor Trent Davis on this Wednesday, February the 2nd, 2022 at 7 p.m. All are asked to attend. We encourage all our members and followers to join us this Sunday, the first Sunday of the month at 6 p.m. for our communion service as we share in the body and blood of our Lord. Again, we look forward to seeing you all. The Usher Board is currently looking for volunteers to serve one or two Sundays a month. If you are interested, please see Deacon Sandra Fountain after the service today. The new members' orientation classes began last week, but it's not too late to join. You can attend our in-person classes on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. here at the church or online Wednesday at 7 p.m. This week's lesson will be taught by Pastor Sheila Smith on what we believe. Join us for an exciting time. The Golden Gates Children Ministry presents Back to Children's Church on February the 20, 2022. Bring your kids and grandkids, tell a friend and your neighbors. And if you have a heart or a love for working with children, we are looking for you. So please contact Sister Sherry Dames at 428-2737. The Bay is back and Friday nights are for fun, fellowship, and sometimes food. Drop in this Friday from 8 to 10 p.m. and take part in our open discussions, games, moments in the Word, and prayer. If you are 12 years and older, we'd love to have you join us. Bring a friend, wear something green, and let's grow as we go. It's celebration time here at the gates. And for those persons who would have celebrated their birthday in the last two weeks, we have not forgotten you. So on behalf of the leadership team here at the gates, we would like to extend a happy birthday and a happy anniversary to the following persons. Omari Neely, Anthony Lopez Jr., Michaela Demerit, Alicia Smith-Rowe, Deacon Sophia Ferguson, Carleen Dean, Stephanie Monroe, Philip Starrup, Minister Flores Marshall, Jaina Ward, Denise Johnson, Leonard Hall, Minister Ruby Strawn, Paula Mae Lundy, Christopher Pinder, Kristen Green, Carl Cooper, Nakia Forbes, Aaron Davis, Maurice Rowe, Elder Sybil Archer, Dalen Williams Jr., Kaylee Nelson, Yvette Woods, McNaird Benneby Jr., 
Sanaya Morley, Sherving Monroe Sr., Mikhail Rigby, Dr. Erlene Davis, and Alice Williams. And a happy anniversary goes out to John and Karen Rigby, who celebrated 37 years of marriage. May God continue to bless you on your birthdays and anniversaries. Our church is on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. To find us, type in Golden Gates World Outreach Ministries on Facebook and YouTube. And simply type Golden Gates Church on Instagram and look for our logo. If you want to be a part of the church's WhatsApp broadcast chat, where you will only receive information that's relevant to the church, just store the WhatsApp number, that's 434-6770, in your phone and send a WhatsApp text message saying, add me and let the updates roll in. Those were your news and announcements. And before we go, we would like to remind you of our Monday night prayer with Archbishop Ross Davis and Pastor Trent Davis at 8 p.m. And we can't forget our Thursday night Bible study with Pastor Trent Davis at 8 p.m. Once again, I'm Dikia Scott. Stay safe, everyone.